it's the teen talk Jurgen Klopp has just held his pre... Who are we playing at the weekend? I forgot who we're playing at the weekend. Crystal Palace. There's too many games. <laughs> There's too many football games. Crystal Palace who are playing I was going to say Villa. I, I, honestly, we've been we've been talking about three different teams. I've not heard anyone talk about Crystal Palace besides Roy, uh, besides Jurgen saying Roy's a great fellow, which I, I hate when Jurgen lies. Anyway, joining me straight to that, I've got Mo Stewart, I've got Ian Salmon, you can tell it's Christmas. Uh, we'll go straight into Jurgen talking about Virgil van Dijk. Always was, will always be, will be. Virgil is um, the best defender in the world, so... Um, uh, and uh, did you have uh, lesser good spells? Yes. If you show me one who never had, I would be really happy to, to meet him, to be honest. Probably that's how we all are when we look back in the past and the Rio Ferdinands on that planet and not to blame him, but well, then good all the time or Yap Stam or Sami Hippie, whatever, always perfect. Nobody was and nobody will be. So. Um, Yes, words in that shape is for us super, 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 super important. Yeah, Ian, it's, it's, it's a strange thing with, with Virgil, really, as, as Jürgen says there. There's, there's, no, there's no player who ever goes through their career with, with absolute perfection. You know, everyone's going to go through sort of you know, less, lesser moments, if, if you want to call it that. Like, I, I don't know how much I ever bought into the idea like, that, that Virgil was like, you know, completely done or over. I think there was a point where I, I certainly thought he was, he was past his peak. I still felt like he had you know, lows to offer to this Liverpool side, even just in terms of, of a defensive setup thing. And I think now, now that, that we've had a couple of injuries in, in, in that area and stuff, it sort of brings into stark contrast, I guess, just how important he is and, and him, him being the sort of the air of stability there. Yeah, well, everything's cyclical, isn't it? You know, he, he came back from the injury in a far better condition than we ever thought he would yeah. be. You know, coming back and basically playing most of the next season without a stop after a major ACL, ACL injury, you know, it's basically unheard of. And he was brilliant. And then he had a little bit of a drop off at the same time as the team had a bit of a drop off, and the rest of the country went, Wait, Virgil's not very good. He's, no, he's one of the best midfield. Best midfield. He probably would Pro be probably one of the best is, midfield. Yeah. <laughs> In training, he's yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> probably did, well, we see how he finishes as well. Um, he's one of the best centre backs in the world and will remain that way. And I know Jürgen said everybody drops off at some point. I'm thinking maybe Beckenbauer didn't. But mm -hmm. he, um, he had a very good point about um, people talking about Rio Ferdinand, was always perfect. One of the stupidest things I've ever done is have an argument with David Fairclough about whether Rio Ferdinand was overrated or not. I think he was overrated because he had a mistake in him for every game. David Fairclough, who's played a lot more football than I have at a lot higher level, thought I was talking bollocks. So I think you're talking sense there, to be fair. I think, no, I think I'm talking <laughs> sense. Talking I, 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 still think, I, I still think Dave's wrong on that one. <laughs> Um, I've also, the, the coming back, I did the thing in the 80s where, where Kenny came back from having his cheekbone broken against United. And you're like, he's not the same player, is he? Yeah, he is. Mm. It might take him a few weeks, but he's the same player. You don't lose it. It's like the Jan Moby thing. Jan Moby never lost what he could do with the ball because he never ran anywhere anyway. Virgil, there was a moment in the game at the weekend where he basically took the ball. He came in from behind a lad, took the ball, went round him and left him sitting on the floor. Mm. And it was, it was perfect. He, he's got everything. He's got the authority. And I think also he's grown into the role as well. He loves the captain's role. And the extra responsibility has actually elevated him in terms of how he is as a senior professional. And obviously your game changes as you go through the years anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you know, he was relatively old for football when we got him in the first place. Yeah. But why is he now 32? Probably about that, yeah. So he's in the late stage of his career. So the next four years will be different to what the first four years were. But the next four years will exist because he's that good at football. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a bit of a thing, Mo. Like I think we can look at this in, I mean, in, in, in the way that we do with everything in football. We can look at it in black and white. And I've, I've certainly been guilty of this. Like I remember talking on shows before about, you know, maybe Virgil didn't quite trust in his, in his body at moments yep. and, and things like that. I actually, I actually wonder if there's a bit more of a nuanced thing here where, you know, he was, he was missing from the Liverpool setup for, for effectively a year. You know, not even able to, to, you know, go and train with his teammates or anything. The Liverpool team shifted you know so much in, in, in that time in terms of mentality they went through one of their, their worst spells that we've, that we've had under Jurgen Klopp you know if you do miss a year and you're, and you're a player like Virgil mm. who you know sets so much of the foundation for what, for what Liverpool were able to go and do of course if you miss a year and miss a year of development of, of that football team it's all going to look a little bit different by the time you come back definitely and 
I think that kind of evolution of the team is something that we kind of really do need to flag up because we always talk about players in a vacuum and their own individual performance. We see how much they are, re are reliant on everyone around them. And I mean, one of the other things we were saying last season when it was all going wrong is how much is the defensive malaise down to what was going on in front of them? And now that's fixed and suddenly yeah. everyone looks better. I think the other thing with Virgil is the international stuff. Because like, we, it's almost like we've forgotten. There was literally a World Cup in the middle of the season last year <laughs> and it fucked everything up. <laughs> and Virgil was so keyed into that tournament because he'd missed the Euros previously because of that injury. So I feel like he wanted to do too much. He felt like he was still that Superman. Maybe that season when he came back kind of convinced him as well as us that everything was just A-OK. -okay, but... Ian's right, he's moving into the different phase of his career now. He has to be a bit more realistic about when he needs rest. He's not an uh, uh, undefeatable, invincible Superman anymore, but he is still able to be that on the pitch as long as we look after him around it. And I think the most fascinating thing for me about this whole Virgil thing, more often than not, I could not give two shits what everyone else thinks about our players. Yeah, yeah. However, there are times when it matters. And I think for Virgil, in a similar way for Mo Salah and a similar way for Alisson, there's that aura, there's that authority of, oh shit, I've got to get past him. And I think we saw it against Sheffield United. There Definitely, were a couple of times yeah. when they got through, they did really well at getting to here, and then they looked into Virgil's eyes and they went, Arr! and I think when people were celebrating his downfall, there was a little bit of joy because they wanted that to be true. But... It's not true. And I think getting that aura back in other people's minds is as important as anything else he does for us. Yeah, I think it's important that he's getting that back in, in his mind as well, Ian. Like, the, the aura word is, is funny because I think, like, it was one of the things that opposition fans were, were levelling at Virgil was that, he, that everyone thought he was this aura defender. But I think the aura is almost mo most important to Virgil. It's important that he feels like if this attacker runs at me, it doesn't matter how quick he is, it doesn't matter who he is. I'm going to expect to beat him and, I, and I'm going to make him look like a tit, basically, because that's what he's done to, to so many attackers over the past few weeks. Well, it's just confidence, isn't it? You yeah. know, take away the word aura, just take in the word confidence. So the, the aura that he's got comes from the confidence he has in himself. Yeah. And as you said before, you've been on shows where you said, you know, he's not trusting his body at the moment. At the moment, the one that actually does all the work there, because it is at the moment, because everything's only ever in the moment that you're in. And you move on from that moment. He's moved on from that moment. Yep. He trusts where he is. And he's an impeccable footballer. There was a, a fantastic stack going along the scroll on the bottom of the team talk there. Um, that he has scored in the 15 games he scored for Liverpool. He's won all 15. That 100% record is better than anybody else in the history of the Premier League. Wow. So he's quite that, a decent yeah. player. Yeah, yeah. Whole, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a, that's, a fairly, that's a fairly random yeah. stat, but just throw it at no, people. No, but I think it is important as well, because if you think about the goals he scores, and, and most of them are in and around the penalty area or from a set piece or something, but there is an air of dominance about all of them. He's either beating someone in the air or just kind of nudging someone so they go flying as what happened against Sheffield United. And that finish is so strong and true. It's just like, yeah, I'm back. And that was one of the things that was missing for me. And all this talk of, oh, Virgil's looking very Virgil again. It was like, he hasn't scored yet though. And then he went, it's almost like he heard me and he went. And the whole captain thing I think is really important as well because it's about taking responsibility and yeah. you see that in his game when he's at his best and he's direct, he's barking at other people, he's directing other people. Whenever someone makes a mistake, whether or not it's uh, costly or not, once the ball stopped, <laughs> Virgil's having to go at him. And Klopp mentioned about the change in the leaders and the loss of the leaders gone. Obviously, there was Henderson who on the pitch was the guy who was shouting at people. I don't know if everyone thought they were going to have an easy ride of it now Virgil's around. But no, they're not. <laughs> Absolutely not. We've got from one player for, who has many important acts left to compete for Liverpool to a player who maybe has had his last act for Liverpool, Lacroix. Here is Jürgen Klopp talking about Joel Matip. It's true. So, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that the club will show their class, just how we should do it. Um, even um, we have to... I'm pretty sure the club told Joel already that whatever happens. So as long as he's injured, everything is fine. And now we have to make decision together with Joel how it looks after that. But it's, um, it's a normal thing to do. But yes, he deserves all the support from us, obviously, and he will get it. Definitely. I mean, the potential for a, a new contract for him or I would say so, but it's not my decision in the end. I cannot, I cannot sign the, the papers. 
yeah, I, I like this answer from Jurgen Mo because it, I think the thing we all worried about, didn't we, when, when Joel Matip goes down with the injury and when we hear it's bad noise kind of things is that you know his contract's up in the summer. He, he, he's not been sort of, you know, the reliable, and, and I mean this in, a, in an availability sense entirely, he's not been reliable in terms of availability for, for a couple of seasons now for Liverpool. I mean, arguably since the start of his Liverpool career, but particularly in, in, in more recent times. Kanate has obviously come into the fold. Suddenly, you do sort of look at it and think, well, is, is there much point in renewing his contract? But what I liked about this from Jürgen is that it does seem like that, that door is still open mm. and, and you do expect that Liverpool will, will just do what's right by the footballer. I think that's the main thing um, when he said that he expects Liverpool to show their class. I think that's what he was referring to. I think back to when Alex also chamberlain got injured in pre-season at a time when we were planning to sell him mm. and then we decided not to sell him. We, we, obviously, there's a little bit of protecting his value. That's yeah. not really the case here with Joel. I think in terms of... Him coming to the end of his Liverpool career, I think it's really fascinating how many times Joel Matip has come back from the dead. Like, I think we, we forget sometimes, but he was almost... Um, well, if you think about how his partnership with Lovren back in the day, that was kind of seen as, oh, we need to get away from that. And it was only when Virgil came in, people thought we were going to sign another Virgil when Matip was going to be gone as well. So he's, he's come back when we thought we was, uh, got all of our use from him on more than one occasion. So I wouldn't be surprised to see it happen again. <sighs> but my main emotion at the moment is like you, heartbroken, because he absolutely did not deserve that. If you think about the two major things that have happened to him this season, the own goal at Spurs and now this, yeah. like he completely undeserved when, as I say, he's come back and he's been so useful. And there are still things that he does that no one else in our centre half room can do. And I think we've seen this season, there's been times when people have expected Canate to start a massive start and they've been like, oh, why is that? And then you watch the game, you see, oh, that's why. So I'm really going to miss him. But I think the idea of keeping him around, at least to do his rehabilitation, see where we are with that, because it's going to be a long rehabilitation. But he deserves to have the peace of mind not to be worried about his next uh, paycheck while mm. he's in rehabilitation, I think. Yeah, and you almost don't want to do the, the comparison thing, Ian, because, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm sick of people comparing Liverpool players, higher Andy Bell. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the thing I like the most about Matip is, is that like, he doesn't seem like he ever gets out of second gear. And, and listen, sometimes that can be a, a hindrance as much as it can be a help, but it's one of the things I've really liked this season is that when Liverpool have struggled at times defensively. And, and I think Canate and Gomez, it's, it's, you know, there's almost a bit of youthful exuberance with, with them both there. And, and, I'm, and I know how old Joe Gomez is. I'm fully aware that he's, he's not the sort of kid he used to be anymore. But it feels like... He's a very those, youthful 27. He's very youthful 27, like me. Um, it, it, when, when he comes in, he does just seems to want, like, really want to impress. And it's the same with Canate. I think, like, you see Canate when he comes into that Sheffield game. There is such a, 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 a like, a desire there to impress. With Matip, you never get that sense, and it is just this always like this calm and composure that, that he brings to that defensive line. And, and listen, when you're next to Virgil Van Dijk, it's easy to feel calm and composed because he's he's the most calm and composed man in the world. But that's that was the, the sort of key thing that Matip brought, and that's that's the thing I think we are going to miss a lot this season now. Yeah, I think Matip's been impeccable this season. I think it's been some of his best football for yeah. us, and he he has um, you know th there's no mistakes you can possibly point to. to previous seasons, you know. It's been the odd game where he struggled. There's, there couldn't really point to anything this season of, of any kind like that. And he's um, he's he's always got that that wonderful that that elegant sort of meander, which nobody seems to ever catch up with him or tackle him. He just keeps going. It's like it's like everyone's still shocked. It's, it's, it's like Rob said. It's like seeing a horse on the pitch. <laughs> it's like you, you, suddenly Joel Matip's up at the penalty area, and you've no idea how he got there. You've watched it happen, but you're just not registered. But he's just he's like a ninja. Yeah. It's just. But I'm gutted for him because he seems like a really nice bloke. And as soon as he went down, as soon as he came back onto the pitch, and you can see where he was holding and how he was holding his leg. And straight away, it's like, that's ligaments. And there's, there's no two ways. It, it was going to be a bad one. From Jürgen saying he, he thinks Liverpool, he expects Liverpool to show the class, their class would be, you give him another year. And you give him another year, so the lad, as you've just said, has the surety of knowing mm -hmm. that there's pay coming in. Because I know, you know, obviously, they're, they're all very, very comfortable as footballers. But you still, you know, you've still got your mortgage, no matter how big it is. Yeah. You, you've still got to know that you're going to be able to, you know, look after yourself and look after your family and he deserves to have that that comfort of knowledge that he's going to be okay and he's going to be looked after while he recovers because mm. he we didn't pay a single bloody penny for him so 
And Whatever we give them for another year is only what yeah. a centre back would have cost I, us five years. I back. think as well. Sometimes we are guilty of only thinking within the Liverpool prism. So Definitely, we're thinking, yeah. oh, so obviously he's had a lot of injuries over his career. He's coming towards the end. We're thinking he's probably not going to get another contract before this injury. So it's kind of coming to the end of his career. No, it's coming to the end of his Liverpool career. Yeah. He would still be expected himself to be able to play for another three or four years. I mean. Obviously, there are centre halves. If you look after yourself or you're playing in the right system, you can play until very late on. So I believe that he will believe that he could be, and I think that that's something that's really important to consider in all this. We're not just saying, oh well, I mean his career's over now anyway. It's not, and he will want to be able to come back from that. So if we can help him in any way do that, I'm all for it. It's a stupid comparison, but how old is John O'Shea now? <laughs> Because nobody expected John O'Shea to suddenly, in the very late autumn of his career, suddenly end up back where he started, yeah. and and to get another crack at it. Johnny so, Evans. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, Johnny Evans. What is the John O'Shea? Who's yeah. John O'Shea? He's just a basketball. He is dead old. He is dead old. Yes. <laughs> yes. Really yeah. old. Yeah. Johnny Evans. Yeah. The same. I thought he had like some office job before he went to United or something. Back in now. Basically, all United players are the same yeah. player, yeah. Um, and none of them matter to me. But that lad that went back to United, who expected that to happen, it would have been even no. more unexpected if it was who I thought it was. Um, you don't know what, what Joel's got for the next three, four years. So give him another year. And in January, if we've got somebody else in, not this January, obviously January next year, 26, 24. <laughs> not the next January, the one after, the one after that. Yeah, yeah. 2025. Uh, yeah. <laughs> give him a free transfer. <laughs> let, let him go with good grace and let him you know, get a payday. Mm. I was going to go somewhere and, and play his football. Absolutely. Hopefully loads more Joel Matip in our future. Hopefully less John O'Shea in our future. I think that's something we can all hope for. Uh, Crystal Palace in our immediate future, though. Uh, we'll do some team news after Jürgen's injury news. Alison looks good. Um, but I don't know if good enough now for tomorrow. We have to check that with the coaches in the medical department and with Ali, of course. Um, Maka doesn't look good. So... Um, yeah, you have to see it day by day, but um, we were, they were pretty hopeful after the game. They were not that serious. It's not that serious, but in our in the period of the year, um, if you're out for five days, it's 12 games pretty much. So we have to um, we have to wait there um, how he shows up here today. I don't expect him to be ready for tomorrow. Don't know about Thursday or Sunday after that. So um, it's pretty much. Um, uh, what is that? Stop and go. We have to see. Yeah, Mo, it's, it's a really funny thing. Like, we, we, I sort of, I found myself thinking recently, like, when's Alisson back? And, and almost looking at the, the United day and thinking, that seems like it's quite soon from, from when he got his injury. I mean, by the sounds of it, he's, he's back in training already. You always look at it differently with goalkeepers. And it feels maybe a little bit harsh on Kelleher. I thought Kelleher was, was good in the week. He, he, he makes the mm. first big save that he needs to make and sort of seems to settle into it from there. But, I mean, if there's even a sniff of Alisson being able to start this one, I'd, I'd have him straight back in there, I think. I think so as well. I mean, obviously you have to be careful that they're not rushing him back. I think that all of the necessary checks and balances will be made by the sporting mm. people. I think everyone knows how important that is. We don't have to worry is. about that side of things. No, no. Yeah, we are vibes. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. We are, we are the vibes crew. But I think for Jürgen, he knows how important Ali is. And... He, as good as it will be for Kelleher to have an improved performance, and while I don't think he's actually ever played three games in a row for Liverpool before, and that might be something that you're going to say, well, OK, that's another step in your development. And quite frankly, I know I'm, this might come back and bite me, but in terms of goal-scoring ability at the moment, Crystal Palace do not necessarily look like they're within the top teams in, <laughs> in the league. I was going to say, Fulham were scoring goals. Full, full, no, 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 no. hundred goals in a week after that. Yeah, no, you guys were wrong, though. That's <laughs> the difference. <laughs> no, but in, in all seriousness, I, uh, yes. I think if Alisson's 100% fit, if he's ready to go, and back in team training sounded positive, I think you'd see him back. I wouldn't be upset if Kelleher does play against Palace for the reasons I just said, but yeah, I do expect if he is ready, he will be back.
Yeah, and there's, there's a few sort of, I guess, question marks around other areas of the pitch, and the, the McAllister thing. I mean, I thought Endo was, was, was great yeah. in the week. I, I think there's probably a, a, a case for him to go again, what he does up, up, up front. Darwin obviously comes on and, and makes another meaningful contribution on a game in, in a way that he always seems to. The back four probably picks its, it, itself at this stage, but a couple of other questions. Simicus so. comes back in, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. So it, it's Simicus, it's, it's Virgil, it's Canate. I guess the only question would be Canate or Gomez, but I mean, he's barely played Gomez centre half this season. Yeah, so. he's, he's been filling in either. Either side really hasn't he? And he, he's played a lot of football film yeah. on either side. So you don't really want to expose him. So Canati seems obvious. I'd be okay with Kelleher getting another game, but um, Ali's gloves on the table seem like a, a hint that he might be ready to just step <laughs> back in. Um, I'm okay with Endo for Palace. I'd be a lot happier with McAllister being back for United because I mm. think he's so much of what we do going forward. And then the two ahead of him against Palace. You can pair many any two from four really. You, you know you could quite happily bring bring Harvey and you could quite happily bring Curtis in, but Sir Bosley and Gravenberg are you know Sir Bosley and Gravenberg will both push up on Palace anyway. Mm. So you know it's I'm happy with whoever plays. I'd quite like to see Ryan Gravenberg. I would game. as well. I think I, yeah. think I love watching yeah. Gravenberg. Yeah, I mean in general that is true. Uh, I think I look at Palace's most likely midfield: uh, Jefferson Lerma and Chris Richards, who's essentially a centre half. Yeah. And then you've got either Jeff Schlapp or Will Hughes. With all the will in the world, I think Gravenberg can go to Selhurst Park and put on a real performance, a real dominant show, like the one that Yaya Toure used to do when he used to go there with Little Boy them every week. Um, I think that he's got that in him. And I think that this could be one of those games where he can really show what he can bring to this team, he can really show what he's learned. I mean, I wouldn't really be upset for any of the others. Like I say, I feel like we're in a good space with our midfield where they're all able to come in and contribute. I would have, to be honest, I would have rested McAllister against Sheffield United. I did kind of say that. And it does look like he's kind of needed a bit of a break. So this enforced one might work out well in some ways. Like Ian said, I think Endo's getting to the point where he's feeling more confident in himself to be able to go out and do what the manager wants. So while he's in a good moment, maybe keep him going as well. Yeah, so we'll round off with score predictions then. I'll come to you first, Steve, for yours. 3-0. 3-0, love it. Mark? I'm going to say 2-0. 2-0? Sounds like you might be a shithouse man. Am I, am I, am I getting that? <laughs> Is that what I'm getting there? Or? No, 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 no. I think that 2-0, we're going to do to Palace exactly what we did to Sheffield United and exactly what Bournemouth did to Palace. It's a Christmas period to muddle through. We've muddled through this team talk today, but I'm not a shit house, of course, so I'm going to fuse these two guys' scores together. I'm going to go 5 0 to the Reds. <laughs> the ultimate LFC experience is Liverpool winning 5 0 in December and muddling through this Christmas period. Find out more about the ultimate LFC experience here. <laughs> John Givers from the Anfield app here at Anfield to sample the ultimate Anfield experience. We've also brought a subscriber, Jamie, along with us as well. It's his birthday. What a birthday treat it's going to be. So let's get in. I'm feeling like a little kid at Christmas, even though I'm 33. And I just think it's going to get better from here, I reckon. So not a bad start today, mate. We've been in the boardroom, out here in the pitch, hearing sto stories from Tom. It's been alright, hasn't it? Yeah, it's been great so far. I've really enjoyed myself. So you fancy kick about in Melwood? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> well, let's get changed and get down. Walking onto the bus and how nice it was as well. I felt like a proper footballer. Yeah, you do. It's just these little experiences that just give you that that taste of what it must be like. And imagine doing that every day. It's great that the club can offer something something like this to anyone that wants to come along and do it. You know. And I'm the lucky one that I'm getting to do it first, which is unreal, really, isn't it? So our participants that come onto this experience get to work on the same things that our academy kids work on. The state of the art facilities, obviously former players come down and you know, show, show them how it's done and give them stories about the old days as well. So hopefully the experience for people doing it as a one-off is, is something truly amazing.
This is it. The end of a wonderful day. Whether we like it or not, we're going to have to go home. It's been brilliant, Steel. Fantastic. I scored at Melwood. You can't say that off me. <laughs> and on your birthday to get everything that you've done, it's not bad, is it? Yeah, it's been a great day. Thanks very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, LiverpoolFC.com forward slash stadium hyphen tours. If you want to get involved, great birthday present like for Jamie, great Christmas presents coming up as well. But thanks a lot for them for inviting us today.